This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It's made possible in part by contributions from podcast listeners. Please consider making a contribution by going to the Donate Now tab at mpbonline.org. Thanks for your financial support. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk with creative Mississippians. I'm your host, Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm talking with teaching artist, storyteller, and member of our Mississippi Artist roster, Deterrence Roberts. Welcome, Deterrence. Way hi, good morning. Thanks so, good thanks so much for being here. I'm excited about being here. It's uh, This is fun. I'm going to talk a little bit before we dive in about our artist roster, because this month on the Mississippi Arts Hour, we are spotlighting our artists on the Mississippi Artist Roster and the Mississippi Teaching Artist Roster. If you are not familiar with that, it is a, a list on our website that people have applied and been adjudicated and you know, got the stamp of approval by by panelists to be on this list. So if you're looking for artists to hire, to perform, to come teach, whatever it is, it's a great resource. Um, Deterrence, will you tell us a little bit about just what being on the artist roster has been for you? For me, um, I think obviously it gives you a chance. It puts you in front of people who may never have even considered hiring you before. Mm. Uh, So many people are looking for quality artists, so they go to the roster knowing that they've been vetted. So I have people who will call me and say, hey, we saw your your write-up in the artist roster, and we'd like to have you come come visit, you know, come perform. So it's it's a big, if you're an artist and you love what you do, it's a great opportunity. We certainly, when people call us here, at the Arts Commission and say, I need dot, dot, dot kind of artist. We say, let's go to our artist roster. That's the first thing we do. So it's great. And with that, do you, if people are interested, and I I feel like they're going to be very excited about having a storyteller after they hear this interview, um, do you travel all over the state? Where do you travel? My motto is half stories will travel. All right. Uh, (laughs) So yeah, I've tried to travel all over the state. I've been to Houston, Texas. I've been, uh, I know I've gone to Atlanta. I've gone all over and all over the state from the Gulf Coast all the way up to um, Senatobia. Well, actually even, I guess going even up to Horn Lake. So I've literally gone from the top of the state to the bottom of the state. The extremes, and from yeah. Vicksburg, yeah, from Natchez to Tupelo. So that's awesome. That's wonderful. So let's dive into what you do. And I, you have a very specific style, a very rooted in tradition style of storytelling. And I would love for you to tell us about it. Um, I am a storyteller in uh, really a West African tradition called Jalia. Uh, Jalia or the, the jelly, or you may know the term griot. Um, were artisans. They were musicians, uh, storytellers, historians, um, often played um, instruments, and they were the keepers of the culture, the keepers of the history. So if you wanted to know about a person, they could sing a song that would tell the history of a king or what you know, his actions or a great warrior um, or if you, if you were a jelly in a particular village, you kind of knew all the history of the village and people would come and listen to you, uh, recite the history. And so that's kind of, when I got into storytelling, I really wanted to be, well, professionally at least, um, I was looking for my niche and, and that was, I was drawn to those to that idea of being a keeper of the culture. Mm. And so that's that's kind of how I I perform. I am not the greatest of musicians, um, although I think I own all but one of the traditional West African um, instruments used by the jelly. Um, 
I have a uh, balafone, which is kind of like a wooden xylophone. Mm. I have a kora, which is uh, kind of a lute harp. Mm -hmm. And there's another called the goni, which is like the precursor to the banjo. Mm. Um, when the captives were brought from West Africa to the Americas, trying to recreate uh, their instruments, uh, the goni became the banjo. And wow. So those are, those are kind of, that's one of the instruments I don't have yet, but my wife says I don't have any more room <laughs> <laughs> for any more instruments. But um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my passion, but I love telling folk tales. That's probably my, my thing. I love to, to create a, a, I think stories just open up your mind. Mm -hmm. Um you hear a story today and then you'll go through something and then that story will pop into your mind when you need it for that teaching moment. And that's what I love about, about what I do. So I want to dive a little bit into how it all started for you. So do you remember a story from, you know, childhood or from early in life that really grabbed you and kind of led you down this path? Not particularly. Um, I say that in a sense, I don't remember the exact story, but it was an Anansi story. Uh -huh. And Anansi is the, the trickster spider, Spider-Man from um, West African culture, particularly the, the region of Ghana. Um, when I was a kid, I heard, that was the first time I heard um, I think I want to say a storyteller either came to our class or I read it, but I was just really fascinated by Anansi. Mm. So when I became an adult, yeah, I'm not really an adult, but when I became old enough to have my own children, uh, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to do was share uh, the story of a not stories of Anansi. So I went out and I, I bought uh, a small book of folktales, West African folktales. And I started reading them um, to my baby, the babies, at the, you know. And um, so from there, I start just, you learn the story, so you just start telling the stories. Mm -hmm. And I guess for me, doing that, and then when they finally started school, you know, they always want parents to come and read. By that point, I didn't read to my kids anymore. I just told them stories. Uh -huh. So I came and I told stories to, to their classrooms. And it would be like, hey, uh, do you mind if Miss Johnson's class sits in next time you come and tell? And then before you know it, I'm doing like these full assemblies. And I'm doing it as a parent. Um, Oh, wow. Just because this is what I do. I love to tell stories. So they they were, they were, just, yeah. And so by the time your kids get into middle school, um, they don't want you anymore. They don't, <laughs> they don't, have, they don't have time for you anymore. Um, but then I had a, we had another, uh, a child, like a later in life child, um, it was planned, so it wasn't an oops baby. Uh, <laughs> you were you were wanting and lo and intended to, to that child. Yes, this, yes. <laughs> this was important. So again, the tradition picked back up again, and it was during that time um, that I guess I, I made the transition from being the storytelling dad to to being a professional storyteller. So. I know that you live in Meridian now. Have you have you always lived in Meridian, and did this all happen there? No, I was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. Oh. Uh, but both of my parents are Mississippi born and raised. Um, my dad is from Kemper County, Mississippi, and my mom is from Clay County. Mm. And so I grew up very much a Northern kid with Southern values. In fact, I would get in trouble. People thought I was being smart because I was taught to say yes, ma'am, and, and no, sir. And um, people thought I was being smart if I said yes, ma'am. I was like, don't get smart with me. And I was like, 
My parents said, no, that's the way he was taught. And I spent all, every summer of my life um, down on the farm where my granddad's, you know, lived. And um, one of my grandfathers was a historian and he was a storyteller of sorts. So I could always remember just sitting down and love to listen to him tell stories and tell about him growing up and what they call haint stories, the, the ghost stories that, um, things that he experienced. So I, I always say that storytelling was uh, in me. And so moved, moved to Mississippi um, for college, uh, went to Mississippi State. And uh, my parents shortly moved back to my dad's home place uh, my sophomore year uh, of college. So um, I've been here ever since. I've spent more time in Mississippi than I have anywhere else in the world. Mm. If, if you're just tuning in, I'm talking with storyteller and teaching artist DeTerrence Roberts. And DeTerrence, so you said you grew up in Flint, Michigan. You came, you spent time in Mississippi in the summers and then ended up moving here in college. So I am curious, I'm always so fascinated by how Mississippi plays into people's art. And it sounds like from what you just said that the storytelling was really kind of fed here by your grandfather. Yes, uh, that's for sure. Mm. Um, I love to hear him tell stories. Uh, it didn't matter what it was. Um, and and I think that's, that's the key and part of the culture. Um, just and I think this rich is just a rich Southern tradition. Um, I didn't hear it quite as much growing up in Flint, other than you know my parents or um, their friends would come over and they'd talk about their experiences growing up or something like that. But um, yeah, it's such a rich culture. Everything is so vibrant. The language, um, the way we talk, our dialects, everything just lends to great storytelling. And I'm, I'm one of those that I jump into accents when I tell stories. So I have to be careful that I don't offend, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm quick to uh, jump into an accent for one of my stories, whether it's um, a Caribbean accent or whether it's a Southern accent. Um, yeah, that's, that's just, just the fun part of it. When you grew up, when you were growing up and you would come and visit your family here, did you find yourself carrying the Southern accent back with you when you went back to Michigan? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, even now, like people will tell me, oh, you don't have an accent. But then I will talk to somebody or like one of my friends, uh, like high, high school friends, and their accents are so pronounced. Mm. And... But I can remember coming coming home and it's like, oh, you sound so country. <laughs> and it would last for about a week or two before I, I got back into uh, that Midwestern, which to me had no accent. Mm. But now I really, I can hear it. You hear it. You know, it's funny because my, my mom and her siblings, they grew up in Mississippi, but to this day, I can tell when she's talking to one of them on the telephone because they get more Southern with each other, mm -hmm. you know, it just kind of accelerates it. Um, so I've, I, I imagine that that stuck pretty hard when you had been here. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at five. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. 
You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission, and today I'm talking with storyteller Deterrence Roberts. So, Deterrence, I know in addition to storytelling, you do many, many things. So, tell us what some other elements of your life are. Oh, man. Everything is a story. (laughs) What do I do? Um... Well, I am, uh, I consider myself a tri-vocational minister. Mm. Um, actually, I'm probably quad-vocational, but I, I don't want to brag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I am a, I am a church planning pastor. Uh, I pastor a, a church called Parables. Mm. And as you would imagine, um, most of the, the preaching is done through story. And the Bible is more than 70% narrative. And so it's, it's really easy to, to just tell the story um, and to teach that, that way. Um, I also uh, work with the Meridian Freedom Project. I was hired on as the director of literacy. And the same passions that I carry with me through... Um, through storytelling and through through ministry, I can do right here uh, on a daily basis with uh, the Freedom Fellows, as we call them. Mm-hmm. And so that that's fun. We're a leadership development program kind of built around the Freedom Schools of 1964. Mm-hmm. And so, which is really neat, because if you go back and look at the concept of the Freedom Schools, arts were a big part of what they were doing. They were integrating art into programming before it became really cool, uh, especially here in the South. So that's that's always exciting. And of course, you know, I'm a a storyteller and I'm also a teaching artist. So I guess that does cover four. Uh, (laughs) So, um, but yeah, so I get a chance to to tell stories at least once a day. at least once a day. So that, that's the, the fun part of my world. You mentioned um, the the Freedom Schools and arts integration. And I do want to make sure that we talk about the fact that you work with our whole schools program. Um, right. Which, if you're not familiar with, uh, if, our, our, if our audience is not familiar with, is um, very, very heavily uh, rooted in arts integration. Tell us a little bit about whole schools and your role with them. Okay. Um, this well, whole schools is a program uh, opportunity through the state mm-hmm. to help make sure that arts education um, is strong, mm-hmm. and the concept of integrating the arts. And arts integration is simply teaching core subjects and an art form together, and helping by merging them together. You, you learn both and you learn them together, which helps you retain and understand. Mm. And so storytelling is perfect for language arts, mm. uh, science, uh, obviously social studies, um, and even math. And as, as anyone who has a kid in, in school taking math classes, mm. uh, they're becoming word problems. And so uh, teaching, teaching them the, the basics of storytelling and how it ties in with mathematics or it's science or it, it just, it, it sinks. And so yeah. you become masters of two things. You know, you were talking about your work with the Freedom Project and literacy, which I'm sure you are, you know, deeply rooted in using stories with that with that work. So I would, I would love to hear about some personal experiences you've had with seeing how stories encourage literacy with young people. I think one of the things is you want, you want to catch attention. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest problems I see with, with, with children overall are young people. Um, They're not really given opportunities to be creative. And so even reading, um, there's not a lot of comprehension. Mm -hmm. 
because they're just looking at the words and trying their best to recite the words. But when you give them the opportunity to tell the story, um, even if it's in their own words, yeah. hey, what did you hear? Or doing things like reader's theater, um, where they're dramatizing. Uh, recently, we, we had a monologue competition uh, reading some of the works of August Wilson, oh, wow. who's a you know, great playwright. Um, uh, we considered him America's Shakespeare. Um, but to, to see them really understand and, and they're reading with not only comprehension, but expression and fluency becomes a big piece of that because now the words are flowing out of their mouths instead of they're just reading word for word. They're really understanding how to see and to read uh, bigger chunks. And so that makes a, it makes a huge difference. And so when they're reading, now a story is playing in their minds as opposed to just reading the words and they have no idea what they just read. How did you, my background's in theater, so I am totally, you I used to teach theater, <laughs> yeah. And so getting kids to understand what they're saying like, you know, when they say a monologue, how did you, what are some of the um, tactics you use to help students understand what they were saying in those August Wilson monologues? I think part of it, you know, even I call actors love to claim a toolkit. Yes. But I always remind them that storytellers are the first actors. And it's actually the storyteller's toolkit that actors have taken over. And because A becomes or S, everybody thinks it's the actor's story, mm -hmm. the actor's toolkit, not the storyteller's toolkit. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, um, I, I teach them about body, voice, mm -hmm. using their imagination and concentration, and even the collaborative work, working together in cooperation and yeah. collaboration with the audience. And so with that, that being said, the, the, the chance, the opportunity to work with our kids and to get them to really embrace what's going on. So what is, what is this character? How, how do they feel? What's their body like? Um, so, you know, how do they walk? And we'll walk around the room sometimes. Uh, mm. and try to find the, yeah. the body, the, the way that they want. Um, what is their voice like? If you got an 80-year-old man and you're a 16-year-old girl or a 12-year-old girl, uh, you got to give me a man's voice out of there somehow. And, yeah. and so it's like you, you get deeper into it. So it's no longer just the superficial, let me read this. Right. But it's like, who is this person? What is their, what are they like? How do they sound? Uh, using your imagination, because it's like you climb into their skin and, and then you're, you're focused on it. So you're not distracted. You're not giggling. Um, you're just, you're right there. Yeah. And so those, those are some of the things. And that's probably, I think in everything I do, uh, the actor's toolkit or the storyteller's toolkit, is is right there helping me help them understand what's going on i love that you were talking about the storytellers toolkit and how storytellers are the first actors i mean i really think you can say that every art form is storytelling you know whether mm -hmm. it's painting or dance or i mean that's the story that draws us in right it is and it's always of course i'm very selfish i um I love the term for what we do. <laughs> and so, but yes, visual artists are storytellers, singers. Uh, to me, the best stories are the one, the best songs are the ones that tell a story. Um, and so the best paintings, and we do that. I mean, one of the, the things that I'll do with our, our fellows, even before we read a book, we spend time on the cover. Mm. And we go through it. Okay, what do you see? Uh, what do you infer from what you see? <laughs> and so just based upon the cover, tell me a story. What is this story about? What do you think? Uh, to get, get the creativity going because they don't get to be creative. Yeah. 
Uh, kids are just so busy trying to learn information in this rote system that when you give them a blank canvas, they can't do anything. It's like, tell me what to do. Yeah. So this is just my way of helping them to understand and to, to unlock that creativity that will be demanded of them in the workplace, but has never been nurtured till they get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And while, yes, while all artists may be storytellers, I don't want to take away the specificity of, <laughs> of what a storyteller is. A storyteller is. No, no. Yeah. I just want to say, what is it? What is anything without the story, though? You know what I mean? That's where I was right. going. Um, but absolutely. Another thing you said that I just really gravitated to was about collaboration with the audience. And that is so important when anyone is performing. Um, tell us a little bit about what that means to you and how you collaborate with an audience. Well, in, in the style of storytelling that I do, it is very interactive. Mm. So even in the midst of a story, I may ask my audience a question and I expect them to respond. Um, or I'll have them engage uh, if I'm cutting down a tree, it's like, okay, everybody, give me your axes. Let's chop down this tree together. Or I'll sing a piece of a song, and then they have to sing it back to me. Um, all of those things keep us engaged and active. And um, so they're, they're literally a part. And so the story, for me at least, can change based upon the interaction of my audience. Uh, so I'll tell the story to one group and they really love when I go, duh. So I'm going to do <laughs> duh a whole lot, right? <laughs> Where I may go to another audience and they react to something else. And so I'm going to feed whatever they react to. And so it may shift and change my story based upon how they are interacting with me. I have a couple of questions based on that. And I want to make sure I don't forget one of them. One of them is when you interact with audiences, do you find that children are quicker to respond than adults? Cause I've read that you perform for both. Do, right. Is it different between children and adults? Do you have to warm the adults up? <laughs> I think, I think sometimes you have to do both. Mm. Um, I find it funny sometimes though, the adults will be so into the story. Oh, really? That, yes, that it will, um, they, they're talking and they're engaging and, and just like, just like they're one of the kids. And, um, and I have, I'll t most of the time I, I perform with, between mixed audiences, but every once in a while I have the opportunity to, to do like an adult set. So there, there are stories, maybe themes are a little more grown up. Um, and so, but they, they just suck right in. Mm. And it is just so exciting and so much fun to, to do both. But I can remember, well, I was at a library and I had, um, I had a little kid, um, it was so hilarious. I was talking about, it was, I was using one of my accents and I said something about going down to row it. I said, yeah. And he had to go on down that row it. And then a little boy said, he said row it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the entire audience, like I, it was over. <laughs> it was like everybody cracked up. At the little boy, but he was so intense and he was having such a good time. He just blurted it out. I love it. And um, so, yeah, but both of them, both of them will, will draw in. Um, I used to be afraid of preschools and working with preschoolers and Mississippi Broadcasting brought me in to share a story. Um, it was Ladybug, was it Ladybug Girl and the Bug Squad? I think it was. Mm. And so I had all of these preschoolers there in the auditorium and I'm scared to death because I don't know if I can hold the attention of a preschooler. And, but about midway through the story, uh, we were, it was all about make believe and pretend. So we were pretending 
to go across this this log and there was like a sleeping giant. So I had everybody go, shh. And I said, let's walk, man, let's tent. And then we got across. I said, we made it. And all of them went, yeah. They were clapping. And it was like, I can do this. I can, yeah. I can handle no matter how old they are. I can handle this. You know, talking about different ages and generations with, with the way that they're pulled in just really is a testament to the power of stories and the power it of is. your storytelling, definitely. Um, but just how, how stories just communicate with us in a way that, that other things don't. It's so beautiful. We are created, we are designed to learn by story. Mm. No one comes home at the end of the day and says, tell me about your day. And we don't pull out a checklist and go at 8.05, this happens, 6.06, this happens. Yeah. Uh, we go, oh, man, let me tell you about what happened today. Mm -hmm. And you go into the whole story. That's how we learn. Exactly. And I, like I said before, the Bible, which is, you know, for me, one of the greatest teaching methods ever is more than 70% narrative. There's a reason. Before there were written words on the page, stories were passed down and passed down before they were written down so that they could be preserved, not so they could be read, but so they could be told, but you could check and make sure you were telling it properly. Um, so yeah, that's why I think this art form is definitely important along with all the others in, in arts integration. Uh, because our kids will understand it better if you tell them the story. Absolutely. Don't just give them the facts. Give them the story. Absolutely. And so. Well, thank you so much for, for telling us about that. I think it's so important um, that we remember that, all of that. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Leslie Barker with the Mississippi Arts Commission, and I'm talking with storyteller and teaching artist Deterrence Roberts. So Deterrence, uh, we were talking a lot about your style of storytelling um, in the last couple of segments in the West African tradition, but also your personal style. And it sounds like if you're working with an audience, as you said, collaborating with an audience and interacting, then it really might affect where your story goes, which tells me that you might never do it the same way twice. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think um, definitely the, the stories take on the personality of the audience. They help me tell the story. And so based upon even stories that I've told a thousand times, um, are probably never the exact same story um, each time I tell it based upon the audience and audience interaction and, and how they respond. Um, one of the stories I love to tell, they actually, I have them, by the time I'm done, they're pretty much telling the whole story and I'm just going through and, and just kind of cueing them to, <laughs> to keep going. Um, so that story is going to change based upon how the audience interacts or how they engage. And so I think the key to me to re a really good storytelling is the audience participation and buy-in. Mm -hmm. And early on, I learned all these different cues to try to draw people in. Um, and in like some Caribbean cultures, uh, they'll use the term crick 
And so like a storyteller, before he'll even tell or she'll tell, they'll go crick and the audience has to say crack. And um, so if they don't say crack loud enough, he won't tell the story. Mm-hmm. Um, so even in the midst of the story, if he if he's holding them and they're waiting, it's like crick. And they're like crack. And, like, and so they, they want to engage. And so I use story, I use prompts. Uh, like that, or I use like bati o bati, um, which means, you know, are you listening? Are you paying attention? And the response is bati. Mm-hmm. One of my favorites is I go, and the response is ame. Um, so I engage with them. And sometimes I teach that at the beginning, but the stories are going and we're flowing so good that I actually never get a chance to even use it. But it's there just in case I see them starting to drift off that I can, I can suck them back in. But yeah, it's, it's so much fun to, to see an audience and see how they react to certain things. And, and you just feed off of it. Mm-hmm. So the story just morphs. And which is really cool, because sometimes it gives you a whole new approach to the story that you hadn't considered before uh, one particular audience. Well, We've been talking so much about storytelling that I have to ask you, will you tell us a story? Yes. I just don't know what story to tell you. I was telling somebody, I have like, I think I counted them. I have like 60 stories oh, wow. that are stuck in my brain. Um, and those aren't just like all of my stories, but those are the ones I can kind of tell at will. And so, That's a lot. Um, it is a lot. So my wife says, I can't remember what, I need to get at the grocery store, but I can remember all these stories. That's, that's uh, what's taking up store. all the space. You've used all your memory <laughs> right. for, for that. <laughs> I have all, all those stories. One of my favorite stories um, is actually a story. It's a um, Aesop fable uh, that I've kind of stretched. So I'm going to kind of take it and, and try to really convince it really quickly. So here's the story. Uh, there once was a man who was a woodcutter. And every day he would go out and he'd chop wood. I mean, every day. And that's how he provided for his family. Now, he wasn't rich. He just made enough to provide for his family, but they were happy. Well, one particular day he finds a tree. This tree is perfect. He can't wait to cut it down. So he grabs his axe and he starts to chop and he chopped it. You're not helping. Why don't you chop with me? And he chopped and he chopped and he chopped and he chopped and he chopped. And and whoop, all of a sudden, Splash! The axe fell out of his hand and splashed into the water. It went, and he started to cry. I mean, he's bawling. He is crying like man cry. Have you ever heard a man cry? I have, yeah. I mean, no, no, I'm not talking about, like, his eyes were sweating. I'm talking about, like, really crying. Like, (laughs) you know, because we don't like to do that. But this man was bawling because nobody was around Mm. In fact, he didn't even notice that an angel had come up out of the water. And the angel spoke to him and said, why are you so sad? And and he didn't hear it. But you know when you cry, you have to stop and breathe. So when he went, the angel spoke again. Why are you so sad? He opens his eyes. He sees the angel and he's like... I, I, I lost my axe in the water. The angel says, no problem. Splash into the water. It went. And the moment it comes up with this beautiful, solid silver axe. Now understand the axe that he had was an old iron axe that his father had given to him, that his father had given to him. And, and so this silver axe was worth so much money. He could, he could sell it and not have to work for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And the angel said, is this your... He looked at it and he says, no, that's not it. So the angel says, wait, splash into the water. It went and it came back up with a gold axe. Mm -hmm. Is this your axe? And he looked at that axe and realized, man, that axe is worth so much money. I would be rich, never have to work again. So he said, that is not my axe. And no matter how badly he wanted, he knew he should tell the truth. So he did. Well, the angel went back and this time came up with his old axe, but then said, because you were so honest, I want to give you the gold axe and the silver axe as a gift. He was so grateful. He took the axes and went into the village. Everybody was amazed 
Well, there was another woodcutter in that village who was very upset because he thought he deserved the gold axe. So he took his old axe, he went down to the water, he threw it in the water, and he pretended to cry. <laughs> well, the angel came up out of the water and asked, why are you so sad? He said, I lost my axe in the water. So the angel said, wait, splash it went. After a moment, he came up with a solid gold axe. Is this your axe? Yes, that's my axe. It sure is. Thank you so very much. And he reached out to grab it and the angel said, no, this is not your axe. And because you will not tell the truth, not only will I not give you this gold axe, I will not return your old axe. And the angel disappeared into the water. Mm. Now the woodcutter realized he didn't have the axe that he desired but he no longer had a way to provide for his family. So guess what he did? He sat down, but this time he cried real tears. And that is my story. Oh, I love it. I never heard that one before. That is his one, it's called The Honest Woodsman. Um, if you find a collection of uh, Aesop fables, I love that. Um, and again, it's probably about four lines long. Uh, so that's a, <laughs> that's a whole lot. And that's the shortened version of the story that I tell. And you get the kids or whoever's in the audience to chop along with you? Uh, we chop along. And by the time we're done, like the splash, like it's so repetitive that they'll go splash. And they'll even do, why are you so sad? They'll I love just it. pick up and they'll, they'll engage. And so the story takes on its own life um, because they kind of know what's going to come next. And so they 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 jump right in with it. And I love the, the imagery of this angel rising up out of the water. It's beautiful. It is. What are some of your other kind of, I know you, you said you had like 60 in your head, but what are some of your other go-to stories that you love to tell? Uh, let's see. I love any Anansi story. Uh, one of my favorite Anansi stories, actually I have so many favorites, um, but one of them is a story about, um, it's called Anansi and the Snake. Mm. And I tell the story with the Caribbean accent. Um it's a story about basically how all stories in the world are named after a Nazi. Mm. And so it's, it's, uh, there's another one, uh, that incorporates like three or four different tasks that he has to do. But this one is just based on one task. Mm. Uh, so that, that's definitely one of my favorite stories. Um, I've recently recorded a story, um, for grown people. And which is really cool. And um, that particular story is called The Fisherman's Knot. And it's a love story um, about a guy who abandons true love, mm -hmm. looking for something that he thought was love. And he ends up with nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the idea of uh, love found, love lost, and love longed for. I'm glad you mentioned that. Could you tell us a little more about your recent recording project? Sure. I uh, work with a, lo well, a local artist here in Meridian by the name of Roger Fox. Um, he's a musician, uh, very talented. So came into the studio with him and I'm featured on, the story is actually called, the, the song is called The Fisherman's Knot uh, by Roger Fox featuring Dr. Terrence Roberts. Um, you can find it on all the different Spotify, oh. Amazon, iTunes, every, every major platform. Um, but it's, it's a simple love story. It takes place in West Africa. Um, and it's just a beautiful story, but it's a beautiful uh, jazz theme that goes up underneath. So it's kind of, although it's a song that he had prepared, there's a great deal of improv. So he is like playing around my emotions and, and how I'm telling the story. So it's a perfect merger of music and story 
And no matter how often you hear it, I mean, it's my story, but every time I hear it, I get drawn in <laughs> to the story and especially the moral, the message of the story. The Fisherman's Knot. I'm very excited to listen mm-hmm. to that. How can people find out about your work or if they want to book you, where do they go? Uh, the easiest place to do is to contact me um, through the artist roster, probably. Um, all my information is there. Uh, so they can go to the Mississippi artist roster and look for Dr. Terrence Roberts. Uh, I also have a webpage, uh, The Story Weaver. Uh, D-A-S-T-O-R-Y-W-E-A-V-E-R.com. Um, all my information is on there. Give me a you know, call, uh, shoot me an email. Um, my email is simple, thestoryweaver at gmail.com. So, yeah, and have stories, we'll travel. Can't wait to come and, and share and based upon your needs, um, I can I can hook you up. Love it. Have stories, we'll travel. Da Terrence, thank you so much for being here today. It's been just a joy talking with you. Oh, it's been a lot of fun for me. And thank you to our audience for listening. Remember to tune in each week for the Mississippi Arts Hour, a co-production of MPB Think Radio and the Mississippi Arts Commission. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners. So if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. When you look at your vehicle, think of MPB. Need to get rid of your ride? Donate it by calling 877-MPB-4-CAR. Need to have some work done on your truck? Listen to AutoCorrect Thursdays at 10, Saturdays at 11. An MPB license plate reminds you that MPB is with you wherever you go. Go to your county office and ask for 